In this study, as you know, we are in part 10. We have been learning about how to know God and why it matters for a child of God today to know God. And now that we have discussed the major attributes of God, we gain, I believe, further insight into His nature by the revelation of His personal name. Now over there in Exodus chapter 3, God reveals his personal name to Moses this way. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? What is your name? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. God reveals his personal name to Moses as I am. And that's not all. That name I am is so important. It is so meaningful that when the Lord Jesus Christ used it, his enemies tried to stone him for blasphemy. When he said in John chapter 8 and verse 58, and Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. When God reveals his name for the first time, our King James Bible puts it in all caps. If you add this to the second revelation of the name given, as what we will find as a transliteration, and that simply means the Hebrew letters are translated into English for us, over there in Exodus chapter 6 and verse number 3, we have further revelation. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. So if you put the two together from Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 6, you find, I am that I am. I am Jehovah. Why is this so important? Well, for one thing, the Lord's name Jehovah is not found in many, most modern versions. As a matter of fact, most will change it to Yahweh. That was placed there by many German Bible critics in the 19th century. His name is Jehovah, not Yahweh. And what is the reason for the German criticism upon the text? That is something that I do not have time to get into today, but I have some really good theories. <laughs> Jehovah is God's name. And he wants us to know him. The Bible says in Psalm 83, 18, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Now, I, I don't think, if you've been at any time here at church, that this will surprise you, that the name Jehovah is found seven times in our King James Bible. Not only that, three times, a descriptive word is added to the name Jehovah to reveal further significance of that name and his nature. So we will go to the first mention of the word Jehovah, and that is found here in Genesis chapter 22. In one of the most famous narratives of the Old Testament, where Abraham's faith was tested in God's request for him to offer up his son Isaac. We would be remiss if we did not pause and say that is a staggering request from God. But see, God's demand is, as we find over there in Proverbs 23, Son, give me thine heart. Give me thine heart. It is not our intellect, and it's a good thing for many of you, it is not our talents, our money, but our heart that God wants first. When we have responded to God's requirement, he, he lays his hand on something especially near and dear to us to prove the genuineness of our response. For God requires truth, not only on the inside, but also on the outside. So he deals with Abraham. And I believe he deals with us in the same way. But at the end of the story, it is revealed that God is Jehovah Jireh, meaning in verse, that we gather from verse number eight, that the Lord provides. 
And today, we're going to look at this narrative and learn just what it is that God provides for us. I want you to see first tonight, t this morning, what can God provide for us? Number one, He provides an occasion to trust. He provides for us an occasion to trust. God commands Abraham, in verse number one, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. You say, now wait a minute, I, I thought over there in the book of James, it says that God tempts no man. Where it says that God tempted Abraham. No, you got to read the whole text. It says in the book of James that God does not tempt man with evil. There's a difference. Amen? Words mean things. Amen? And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Amazing thing that Abraham is communicating with God audibly. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now that's interesting. Isaac, thine only son. Well, physically speaking, that was not Abraham's only son. That was one that was born years earlier to Abraham. But we understand the scripture says God had promised Abraham that he would have a son and through his lineage would the Messiah come. Bible says in Genesis 12 in verse number 3 for example, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. He said again in Genesis chapter 17 in verse number 19 this. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Foolishly, Abraham and Sarah agreed that Abraham would have a son by another woman, by his concubine Hagar, which he got from Egypt, by the way, and his name was Ishmael. The reason why they did that was because Sarah had not yet conceived in her old age. But we find that God did indeed, even with that act of disobedience and disbelief, God did indeed give Abraham a son, Isaac, from Sarah. But Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. Ladies, how you feel about that? This son, whom the promises of God would come through, was to be killed. Hmm. Why? Well, no believer has really been tempted or tried until he has been tempted and tried on the things that he truly loves. Men are what they love and fear. Profession or training have very little to do with it. You show me a man that loves what he loves and what scares him, and I've got that man's number. The devil looks at it the same way. Affections determine decisions, and decisions determine destinations. Just ask Demas, just ask Ruth, just ask Peter, just ask Paul, or anybody else in or out of the Bible. If a man has never been tested on the point of what he loves most, then he has not been tested at all. By such a standard, the average liberal in social clubs called churches today has never had his hat in the ring when it comes to biblical Christianity. Why? For Jesus said that if a man loves him, he would keep his words. The Bible says in John 15, 7 this, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will. It says over there in chapter 14 and verse number 23, Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and he will come to him and make our abode with him. Man's never been tested on anything because he doesn't love the Bible. See how that works? There are a lot of professing Christians today who back off from the Bible under charges of the Word of God being old-fashioned, fanatical, radical, insane, that, that we who believe the Scriptures are troublemakers, we're apostles of discord. Those are Christians who have no root. They're not going to be tried and tested on anything. The Bible says over there in the book of Mark chapter 4, in verse number 14 this, 
or 18 I should say. But these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, look, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. See, God doesn't bother with them. Satan doesn't bother with them. Right, because they don't love God's word. A man is tried and tested on the things that he loves and the things that he fears. Their true loves are clearly revealed when the testing comes. Because if you love a thing or a person, you'll stand by it. You'll take abuse for it. You will suffer with it. You will defend it. And you will die for it if necessary. So there's a lot of people who don't love the Word of God today. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Throughout all the scriptures, one of the, the, the terms that we found that it is attributed to God is that he is a jealous God. That he might prove man's love, God often will place his finger upon that which is most precious and ask for that thing to be forsaken. Many of those precious things are not wrong in and of themselves, but they keep us from loving the Lord with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. And that's what we find here. The thing that Abraham loves the most, is he willing to sacrifice it over his love for God? That's the test. Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse number 5, But they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their souls with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal which I commanded not nor spake it neither came it into my mind. You say why did you say that verse? Well that request to offer his son Isaac upon a burnt offering is shocking to Abraham. But notice the Bible says he goes where God tells him to go. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Wow. Can't even get folks to come to Sunday school once a week. Abraham rises up early in the morning to go sacrifice his only son. Hmm. He saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clay to the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. You notice there was no argument with Abraham that this is what happens when you worship a false god, Baal, that, that Baal requires child sacrifice. And not one time did Abraham ask, now wait a minute, God, that's what the heathen gods ask for. That's not what you, did you notice that he rose up early in the morning and did exactly what God asked him to see? God is giving him here an opportunity to trust him, to trust him. How so? Well, I want you to notice a few things here. Would you notice in verse three, the son, the only son, would you notice verse three, the wood? Right? Would you notice in verse 6, the instrument for piercing his side, the knife. Would you notice verse 6, the fire, which, comparing Scripture with Scripture, roasted the lamb that was slain in Exodus chapter 12 and John chapter 19. Isaac is plainly a type of the only begotten Son of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to see. This is an opportunity, an occasion to simply trust God. And Abraham, verse 5, said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And I love this. Because he didn't have to add this last part, did he? But it shows the heart of Abraham. He's, he's got an occasion here to actually trust God's word. Because he says... I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and I and the lad will come again to you. Now, what do you mean he has to trust God? Well, now, this is amazing. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. How do we know Moses worked in a coffee shop? Hebrews, amen? Uh, it was... That was rough, I know. <laughs> Hebrews 11, look at verse number 17. 
Some of y'all didn't get it, amen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And that he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. See, remember what God had already promised Abraham. And he says specifically, not in any other son, but in Isaac shall all families of the earth be blessed. That your family is going to be as the sin of sin. Well, that, well Ab Isaac wasn't married yet. He didn't have a wife yet. Isaac didn't have children yet. But God said that it was through Isaac that the line would come for the Messiah to be born. So here is an occasion for Abraham to take God at his word. Amen. Watch this. Accounting that God was able to raise him up. If God required me to sacrifice my only begotten son, I believe that God has the power to raise up Isaac again because I believe God's word that in Isaac shall the Messiah be born. So when he says to the men, I and the lad are going to go to worship, and don't worry, we're going to come back to you, Abraham really believed the word of God that Isaac had to be resurrected because he wasn't married yet and he didn't have any kids yet. Isn't that amazing? Isaac sees everything needed for the sacrifice. I find this humorous. I, I can just imagine. He's looking around. Dad, uh, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, Where's the lamb? I love, did you catch how Abraham said this? Verse 8. I believe it has a dual meaning here. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. I believe that's part of it. He'll provide the offering. But I also believe there's another emphasis here. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. See, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, is God himself. Amen. So God will provide... Oh, he'll provide a sacrifice, but guess who that sacrifice was? Himself. The Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. He'll provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And so they went, both of them together. And so can you imagine the drama right here unfolding? And they came to the place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. Now I want you to think about that just for a moment. Abraham was an old man at this time. 100 years old, at least. Y'all with me? In order for him to bind, now it's possible he's just super strong, but you don't see any arguing here. I believe that Isaac offered himself. Isaac, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. I think Isaac could have probably gotten away from his dear old dad. But the Bible says that he stretched forth his hand and he took the knife to slay his... He was ready to kill him. And Abraham's acts on God's word, regardless of, uh, of appearances, lack of evidence, circumstances, objections, feelings, social pressures, habit, custom, blood relationship, to find such a man today like Abraham would be just about impossible. The knife is up. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord called out from heaven for Abraham to stop. I bet those were the sweetest words, the sweetest sound that Abraham has ever heard. Isaac would have been a dead young man if the angel of the Lord had intervened. And here's the greatest part. Abraham was willing to do it because he thought maybe he'd see a resurrection. He believed the word of of God. He was in the act, Abraham was. It wasn't just lip service. Man, there's a lot of believers today who, who claim to love God, but they're not willing. They're not willing to be tried. There's a lot of folks today that say 
that they trust God. But when the going gets tough, how quickly we go back into despair, really actually in our minds, believing God doesn't care about our life. We say, but you see our actions, our outward expression does not back up what we think we believe on the inside. Do you really trust God? Well, then we'd act like it. We've got an election coming up in a few weeks. Do you trust God? There'll be a lot of believers today that if their candidate doesn't win, all of a sudden now our nation is destroyed and over. Right? Oh, the devil must have won. Well, you don't really trust God. You're wringing your hands, worried about every single situation that happens in your life. Do you really trust God? Abraham, I'd say he proved it, don't you? See, this is an opportunity. One of the things that God provides for us is, the is an occasion to trust Him. And when we trust Him and we see God meet the need right where it is, listen, the next time stronger trials will come, we will be uh, more mature. We will be stronger, more rooted and grounded in our faith. And we'll be able to handle even those more difficult problems. There's some Christians today that haven't grown one bit since they got saved 20, 30 years ago, right? Because they're not willing to be tried of the Lord. And we don't believe him for much less than what Abraham believed him for. What can God provide for us? An occasion to trust. That's what he provides for us. I want you to see, secondly, an opportunity to teach. An opportunity to teach. Would you notice in verse number one, back it, it says that Abraham was tempted. He says, take now thy son. And the Bible says in verse number three that he saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. That's in verse, look at verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come in again to you. Look down in verse number 19. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together in Beersheba. Now one thing that I noticed before we, this narrative here in, in Genesis chapter 22, is that we find that Isaac, Abraham's only son, was heavily influenced by what his father did. For example, we find that when there was a famine in, uh, in the land, that Abraham, without talking to God, without consulting him at all, he felt like he needed to go down to Egypt. Watch out in the Word of God when anybody goes down. Especially when they go down to Egypt. Egypt is a great picture of the world and the world system. And anytime anybody tries to find solace in Egypt, it never turns out right for them. So Abraham goes down to Egypt because there's a famine. Genesis, uh, I think, chapter 12. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And while he was there, we find that he met a woman named Hagar. Isn't that something? Well, you know, it's amazing. When there was a famine, Abram, instead of trusting God, Went to where the food was. You know, it's amazing. Isaac did the exact same thing. In chapter 26 and verse number one, and there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abram. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Now, you know what's so amazing about that is Isaac is, is going after the things that his father did. Well, while he's down there in Egypt, Abraham is afraid that Pharaoh is going to take Sarah to be his wife because apparently Sarah's lovely. And they thought he was going to get killed, so, so he lied. He said, she's not my wife, she's my sister. Now, by the way, that would have only helped Abraham out, not really Sarah. Because Sarah would be like, well, all right. She's still going. Look, let's go back to the text. Look, let's look at uh, uh, chapter... 20 and verse number 1. And Abraham sojourned from thence to the south country, dwelled between Cadus and Shur, and sojourned to Gerar. And Abraham said to Sarah's wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech came of Gerar came and took Sarah. Well, Abimelech didn't do anything wrong. Right? He thought that Sarah was Abraham's sister. Where did he get that? Because Abraham told him that. 
And then, by the way, the first dream in the Bible, God tells Abimelech, if you touch her, I'll kill you. <laughs> well, you think that Isaac would learn, but Isaac's going to do whatever his father does. And so a few chapters later, and Isaac also dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, uh, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look on. And it came to pass, when there had been a long time, that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah's wife. That's a real nice say, a way of saying they were flirting with each other, you know. So... I don't know how they do things out there in the land of Ur. <laughs> but you know, brothers and sisters really don't get along like that. I think something else is going on, you know. Isaac's doing the same thing that Abraham did. She's my sister. She's my sister. Huh. What else is amazing? We find that Abraham had a, a, a son that he preferred. Abraham preferred Isaac over Ishmael. But you know what's amazing? When Isaac became a father, he had a favorite as well. The Bible says in Genesis 21 and verse number 14, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and gave a bottle of water, gave it unto Hagar, that he got in Egypt, should have never been in Egypt in the first place, putting it on her shoulder and the child, that's Ishmael, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. It was Isaac that was preferred. Well, Isaac did the same thing to his sons. Chapter 25, verse number 28. And Isaac loved Esau because it, he did eat of his venison. Man's way, a, a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That's scriptural. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So now I want you to notice here in just these four or five examples that I've given you, Abraham certainly had a negative impact on Isaac for the decisions that he's made in his life. But here, see, Abraham has an opportunity to teach Isaac what it means to trust God. And so his act of faith would now affect his relationship with his son. I love the scripture says that Abraham was going to worship God no matter what the cost. He takes Isaac with him, I and the lad. And when they arrived at the place where the Lord had instructed Abraham, he placed Isaac on the altar. He is teaching. I wonder if, if Abraham said, now listen, Isaac, I'm going to kill you right here. You're going to die. But watch this. God promised me that you were going to be the one through whom the Messiah would come. And so just don't worry. It'll be fast. I'll do it as fast as Paul. God is going to raise you from the dead. He's got an opportunity to teach him something here. He's made a lot of mistakes in his life. And men, as fathers, we've made some mistakes in our life. But you've got an opportunity from here on out to teach your children what it means to trust God. And that's what he does. Look at it. Isaac has to lay on the altar voluntarily. He's just as willing how do we know? Well, remember, he's a picture of the Son of God. Nobody took Jesus' life, by the way. He says, I lay down my life. He said, I have the power to take it up again. And so Isaac had to willingly lay there with his 100-year-old dad uh, waiting while he was bound upon the altar. He wouldn't have been able to bind a young man against his will. So maybe Abraham made some mistakes in his life, but he got this one right. He got this one right. Not only that, Abraham was a wealthy man. He had servants with him. And the Bible says that Abraham's servants would certainly observe his commitment to worship. He took two of the young men with him. There were no surprises. There were no secrets concerning his faith in God. Well, I love in verse number five, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. God had not shown him that. But he trusted God's word. He proclaimed his faith to his men. It ought not be a question in anybody's mind whom you work with where your faith and commitment lies. Amen. They ought to know, and you don't have to broadcast it, 
But your life ought to be a living testimony. There ought to be no doubt that you are committed to God's house, that you're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you live differently than the world does. It should not be a doubt in anybody's mind. And if it is, there's something we need to correct. Abraham's servants would observe him. He put his reputation on the line. And look at verse number 19. So Abraham returned unto his young men. Wow. I wonder what the conversation would be. If I was the young man, I would be whispering to my guys. I'd be like, I don't see any blood on Isaac. Wouldn't there be some residue if he did die and he rose from the dead? Wouldn't, wouldn't, we, wouldn't his clothes be stained? I mean, can you imagine the conversation? That went on. Can you imagine those servants watching the look on Abraham's face or perhaps Isaac's face as they came together? Were they, were they talking together? Were they laughing together? Were they smiling together knowing that God had shown him his word and his truth and they trusted in the Lord and he renewed that commitment uh, to Abraham of his covenant with him? I love chapter 23, just a chapter later in verse number 6. They're talking to Abraham. Hear us, my Lord. This is how they feel about him. Thou art a mighty prince among us. That ought to be our testimony, by the way, in the workplace. Amen? But, but there, are too many, there are too many of us that spend more time talking about politics than we do the Word of God. Isn't that something? I was at a, at, a, at a football game this weekend. The, the person that prayed prayed more about politics than he did the Word of God. Isn't it something? Notice, God provides us an opportunity for our life to affect other people. It gives you an opportunity to teach people what it means to be committed to the Word of God and to the Son of God in your life. You've got an opportunity for your life to mean more than just living and dying, just existing. You've got an opportunity to really influence a whole generation of people that are coming up behind you. What are you going to do? Loved ones may not understand us and try to hold us back. Happens all the time. Never understand why. And maybe I just am not committed uh, to, to, to blood relatives like you people are. I don't understand why they would ever keep you from the house of God. Amen. Loved ones may not understand us and try to hold us back. Right? Don't you want to spend time with me? Well, don't you want to spend time with me? You know where I'm at every Sunday and Wednesday. Right. Amen. You didn't like that. Let me move on. <laughs> Friends and co-workers may mock us. May try to make us look foolish for taking a stand. For putting our treasure into the house of God rather than other events. Folks who live in the flesh will ridicule us for believing in a religious book that they say is full of errors even though they can't quote one verse from it. Except maybe judge not. Right? Ironically. People who we love will try to keep us from hearing God's word by convincing us that our love for them is more important than our love for God. But in spite of all that, for every person that is affected negatively by our, our testimony, there will be others who will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through your influence. Many of you have seen your children receive the free gift of salvation that was offered to them through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because it was you that made sure they were in church, that made sure they heard the truth, that made sure that you didn't live a hypocritical life that would cause them to doubt biblical Christianity. For every person that would want to influence you negatively, there are going to be people that you influence positively. There's going to be people that will be affected by you. See, God, what does He provide for us? He gives us an opportunity for our life to have eternal meaning. He gives you an opportunity to teach. Our life could go one of two ways. You know, the Bible says, a life outside of following God, your life's really not any more meaningful than that of the animals. 
What do you mean? Ecclesiastes 3, 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. And one thing befalleth them, as one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. For all is vanity, just like a living animal. All go to one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? We're just, we're just living animals without God. But you know what God does? He gives our life meaning. Amen. Romans chapter 9 and verse number 23. That he may make known the riches of his glory. Look at what he calls us. On the vessels of mercy. That's all we are. We're just vessels. But notice what he makes us vessels of. Mercy. Which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles. You're a vessel of mercy that he might show in you the exceeding riches of his grace. Uh, Ephesians 2 says, in the ages to come. Your life has everlasting, eternal significance because of what Jesus did. That's what he's provided for you. Isn't that wonderful? What can God provide for us? An occasion to trust an opportunity to teach, and finally, huh, just now noon, an occurrence to triumph. An occurrence to triumph. He, he provides victory in your life. Oh, verse number 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. Gosh, I, I'm sure with just such relief. Can you imagine maybe hearing the rustling of the thicket? And can you imagine he just was bowing in worship? And I can just imagine him slowly lifting his eyes and seeing that ram and looking at his son and seeing what God did for him. That he didn't have to go through with it. He didn't have to kill him. And then notice the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. The substitute is now made for the substitute. <laughs> the ram is undoubtedly caught in a thicket of thorns and now becomes a type of Christ. He offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Verse number 13. Wow. God himself has provided for the sinner in the end. So it's clear that Abraham believed that God would either provide a substitute for Isaac or he would just simply raise up Isaac from the dead. And I love that God could have done both or either and God still would have been honored and glorified. But see, that's where the mercy and grace of God comes in that Abraham never had to experience actually putting his only begotten son to death. But folks, that's exactly what God the Father experienced for you and I. He didn't make Abraham go through it, but he went through it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Thou shalt see the travail of his soul, uh, Isaiah 53 says, and shall be satisfied. Wow. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Wow. Wow. So Abraham was ready to worship when it cost him everything. And he worshiped God when God gave him everything. The Bible says in verse number 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. May we, we never forget, time has, has a way, time can heal wounds, but also time has a way of dulling us to the truth of God's word that we once stood upon when we were tried and tested. Remember, the first time the word Jehovah is ever found in God's word, it is with Jireh, which means the Lord provides. And I love this. There's another element 
to that definition. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Not only is it something intangible that we say, oh yeah, God is our provider. No, no. You ready? Because he's Jehovah Jireh, we'll get to experience it and see it in our life. It's not just something we'll say, well, yeah, he's provided for me heaven one day. No, no, no. No, no. Jehovah Jireh means he provides for us and it can be seen and experienced. Victory. You have the opportunity to be strong in your faith and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What did God provide? Well, he provides here a ram. And you know, wouldn't you know it? Of all the types that he could have shown there in the thicket, a ram turns out to be the father of a lamb. Wouldn't you go figure? You see the father and the son at the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The faithful man is tested by the things that he loves. He goes to the place that God tells him to go. He believes in the resurrection. He believes in a lamb that was offered as a sacrifice. He believes that God will provide for him. And he acts regardless of the consequences. Maybe that's why, as James chapter 2 says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Aren't you thankful today? And I love this. Not only does the angel of the Lord say, Abraham, stop. But then, just like the old song says, we'll understand it better by and by. Do you realize you may not understand the reason why you go through the things that you're going through today, but there is going to come a day later where you'll be reminded of that experience where you trusted God. And then you'll realize, oh, that's why I had to go through those things. And that's what the angel of the Lord teaches him here. The angel of the Lord clearly is the Lord Jesus Christ before he's ever born there in a stable in Bethlehem. Because the, the, the word of God makes it clear that the Son of God has always been. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's always been God. He appears as an angel in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. How do we know? Well, you notice the angel of the Lord speaks as God. Back to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 22. I'm almost done, I promise. But we're doing great on time. I don't know what you, you got. I'm, I'm doing great. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. Look at this. The second time. See, God's not going to make you go through things and then not, not help you understand why you had to go through them. He says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Wow, the angel Lord sing by myself. Well, because he's God. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. The angel of the Lord then reinstitutes or, or uh, gives then his covenant with Abraham, the repetition from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. And then he gives some additional information that I don't believe he would have gotten had he not obeyed the Lord here. He says, the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. That was not previously given. Notice he says, because thou hast obeyed my voice. See, there's going to be parts of that covenant that is unconditional, that is based upon what God has said, not upon what Abraham does. But notice, it was imputed. He believed God. It was imputed on him for righteousness. He obeyed the Lord's voice. And so I love this. God adds some wonderful blessings to the covenant. Oh, yeah, we're saved. Yes, we are, are, have been uh, made eternally secure by that Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. And that's wonderful tomorrow. But if we obey the voice of the Lord today, do you know then there are also blessings we get to enjoy now? There are things that God provides for us now? 
See, God, Abraham believed God when he, when he didn't know where, when he didn't know how, when he didn't know when, and when he didn't know why. God said, I need you to do this. He went and did it. And we stop worshiping God over much less, don't we? Mark chapter 4 again and verse number 16. These are they which likewise are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, like many believers are today, and have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. But look at this. Are you as committed today as you once were? What's happened? What's changed? When affliction or persecution ariseth for the world's sake, immediately they're offended. They're offended. Abraham reasoned that he had already received Isaac from the dead in a figure before. Have you thought about that? Why did God wait for Abraham and Sarah to be so old, well stricken in years, before they conceived a child? Well, perhaps it was to teach them to trust him in extraordinary circumstances later. Maybe perhaps when God would ask Abraham to offer up his son. Look at what Hebrews says again. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky, a multitude, and as the sandwiches by the seashore, innumerable. They were all, their seed was all, his seed was already dead, if you will. And notice God had performed a miracle then. So why wouldn't Abraham believe him that he could raise Isaac from the dead? See, we, we are to learn from God's dealings with us in the past on how to handle the situations today. Jehovah Jireh is our provider. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17, and we'll finish with this. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. He's given us the ability to trust and grow in our Christian life, an occasion to trust. He gives our life value and meaning as we influence others, an opportunity to teach. And watch this. He has provided the ultimate substitute in Jesus Christ to give us the victory over sin, death, and eternity. He has given us an occurrence to triumph. Aren't you thankful that God is our provider? Amen. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word this morning. We are